This is Winston Churchill, speaking to you from number 10, Downing Street. Nothing lifts my spirits like a blast of Professor Buzzkill during our darkest hour. He busts myths and takes names like a squadron of spitfires strafing enemy positions. And I'm totally stoked that he's here again to save Western civilization. So relax with your favorite whiskey and become enlightened. Well, there's nothing like a return of your favorite professor, which is me, but there's also nothing like the return of one of my favorite professors, Professor Perry Blatz. He's here in the Buzzkill Bunker to help us talk about some uh, two, at least two, very big flashpoints in the mid-century in the United States. How are you, Professor? I'm I'm doing fine here. I uh, uh, I'm waiting for the extensive re- renovations you have planned for the bunker. It does get, well, uh, but still, it's uh, lovely to be invited, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Well, the, the lady buzzkill keeps looking at me with those. You better clean up your man cave eyes. <laughs> so we'll, we're, we'll do something about that ASAP. Man but, bunker. Yeah, man bunker. <laughs> but one of the things you and I talk a lot about, um, especially when we're out drinking, is is <laughs> The, these two big things that happen in the 1950s that seem mm-hmm. to have been forgotten. The first is, in 1950, there's an attempted assassination on President Truman's life. Yes. And then in the second thing is that in 1953, Congress... 54. Sorry, 54. See, I get so excited That's I even okay. forget the dates. Congress gets shot up by... Essentially, yeah. By terrorists. And these attempts to kill leading politicians are made by the same group of people, Puerto Rican nationalists. So yes. that's what we're here to talk about. Yes, yes. There are two, uh, uh, I guess, they get somewhat less attention. Of course, the attempt on President Truman was unsuccessful. Right. Though, right. Uh, according to some uh, scholarship on it, it, it could well have succeeded. Yeah. And while one congressman was severely wounded, he recovered, and several others who were shot recovered. Right. But shots were fired from the gallery down onto Congress. Also, I think part of it is that while all kinds of uh, feelings for Puerto Rican independence are still rather strongly held. Mm -hmm. Those have never held sway, and of course Puerto Rico is still a commonwealth of the United States, though it is not a state. And of course currently there are a number of uh, financial problems with Puerto Rico and problems about default on Puerto Rican bonds, (laughs) and different issues are very complex and need not be worth getting into here. But Puerto Rico is still very much a part of the United States and occasionally has protested over its inability to vote for president. Puerto Ricans can participate in the primary process. There are primaries, presidential primaries in Puerto Rico, but no elected vote. But still, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. It was part of the United States then uh, and has remained so for all this time. So these were unsuccessful efforts, the terrorist efforts. Their goals were not accomplished. So I think they're also um, you know, forgotten somewhat because of that. But they were um, terribly dramatic and uh, interesting events. Well, let's start then with the flashpoint, the Harry Truman assassination attempt. And one of the things and I'm in league with the buzz killers here. I didn't know much about this, and I certainly didn't know that it was as one of the books we're going to put on the Buzzkill bookshelf says. You know, a shootout in the street. Explain. Oh, yes. how, first of all, we oh, need yes. to explain that this doesn't happen at the White House. Let's put some background on the sure. on the actual attempt on Harry Truman. Sure. Well, President Truman had moved his residence out of the White House because it was being renovated. After Franklin Roosevelt's death, the Trumans move into the White House, Mm -hmm. and it's in uh, pretty bad physical condition. The uh, residence part of it, of course, there are executive office building nearby and different things, and he still goes to that, but it's decided to do a complete renovation, a complete structural renovation, essentially, as I understand it, a kind of gutting of the White House, uh, because not much had been done with it, going back to the time of President Adams, who was the first president, uh, John Adams, not John Quincy, John (laughs) the father, uh, to move into the White House. So extensive work has to be done. And so while he'll still go to offices over there, he lives in Blair House, and there's an adjoining house to it. These are now, I believe, I'm sure there's been extensive renovation to them, they're the uh, residence of the vice president. They've been turned into that. Oh, I, didn't, I thought um, they were always the residence, no, of the vice president? Uh, not at that time. Oh, I see. Not I at see. that time. I, I'm not exactly sure when it's picked up by the vice president. But at this time, it's you know essentially two big row houses 
Mm -hmm. in Washington next to each other. The Blair family was very influential at the time of the Civil War and so on. But that's where the president is living. And what happens on November 1st, 1950, is that President Truman is upstairs in the Blair house taking a nap. Oh, in the middle of the day, the president taking a nap. Yes. How about that? Well, uh, well uh, the president was, I believe, by that point, 67. Okay. And so uh, he needed a little rest, and he was getting ready for a um, ceremony that afternoon at Arlington National Cemetery for mm-hmm. an important British general who had had a vital staff position throughout World War II. I believe it was General Dill was the man's name. Oh, right, right, so there right. was going to be a gathering of dignitaries at Arlington, and I guess the president, after lunch, he went back to Blair House for lunch. Uh, he decided to take a little nap. In a few minutes, he actually hears shots ringing out and can look out his uh, bedroom window and the key, at the, the cr- scene that develops. Yeah, and, and one of the weird things is he does look out the bedroom oh, window. Oh, sure. And one of the sure, secret service sure, yes. looks up and says, get your... Yes, that's <laughs> not correct. Not get your damn full that's head right. down, but basically... That's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, what had happened is that two... Puerto Rican uh, independents, we might today call them activists. You could also call them terrorists. I mean, what they're doing is a violent terrorist act. Came down from New York City just before this, the day before, took the train, went to Washington. They were taking a cab around. They asked about the president in the White House, and they were informed they hadn't known that he was living in Blair House as opposed to the White House. (laughs) I'm not sure what their plan might have been to shoot up the White House. That might have been far more difficult. Though, of the course, security, security was nothing the way it, w- way it is today. Right. Uh, and, of course, we still have, I think, just a few months ago, someone tried to get onto the White House grounds for uh, an attack on President Trump, and that happened with President Obama. So whatever they might have planned, they realized that President Truman would likely be at the Blair House. I'm not sure if they actually knew that he planned to take a nap. I have a suspicion <laughs> they didn't have that information. Yeah. But what happened essentially on the street, and this is across from the White House, there were guard houses on each side of these two row houses yeah. on the sidewalk. Right. And so they came from opposite sides and started firing. And uh, according to this, uh, this book, American Gunfight, uh, that you've mentioned, if the first assassin had been able to fire his weapon directly. He had a little trouble getting his first shot fired. And that delayed a little bit, and that alerted the various White House police as well as Secret Service people in the area. Mm -hmm. And that led to his being wounded. The other gunman came up. He got to fire a few shots. If it hadn't been for a Secret Service agent who, once he was wounded, and he was wounded badly, though he recovered, one policeman was killed, this one who was wounded was not, he managed to get inside the door of the Blair House and close it behind him because it was just a screen. It was a warm day. It was November, but it was a warm day. It was supposedly in the 80s. It's D.C. Yes. And so he sort of pulled the door closed behind him. And if... The first gunman had been able to fire from the very beginning Mm -hmm. and therefore likely stop this Secret Serviceman from struggling back inside once he was wounded and closing the door. These two gunmen may well have been able to get inside the Blair House and then start looking for the president. While there were Secret Service people inside, as well as household staff and so on, yeah. it was really a rather small facility. It wasn't set up to guard the front door uh, in any uh, particularly extensive way. And so the thinking is perhaps they could have gotten upstairs and started looking for the president, or one with the other being wounded and so on. As a result of the attack, one of the gunmen was severely wounded, the other was killed. Mm -hmm. But the thinking is that possibly, if things had gone a little different, one could have gotten inside and perhaps gone uh, hunting for the president. And all this happened within uh, less than a minute on November 1st, 1950. And so it's very, very very dramatic. And it's, it's... It's played out in the news as very dramatic because, of course, it's very close to to uh, actually being successful. I mean, the guy who shot at the window wasn't going to hit Truman. But uh, we're going to hear a little news clip from, from, not a news clip, a news reel that was shown in the movies about this. And it talks about how close it was and also talks about the kind of shootout on the street aspect of it. Hang on, Buzz Killers. We're going downtown to the, uh, downtown, downstairs to the audiovisual department. 
Outside Blair House, the president's temporary Washington home, extreme fanatics of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party try to force their way in, guns blazing to assassinate the president of the United States. When the three-minute shooting is over, assassin Griselio Torresola lies dead on the Blair House lawn, and White House policeman Leslie Kofeld is dying a few feet away. Assassin Oscar Cayazo and two other guards are wounded as the plot is foiled. Police and Secret Service men examine the damage. A picket on the iron fence is knocked off. The steps and doorway of Blair House bear bullet holes. Only the guards' quick action prevented more casualties. At Washington's emergency hospital, a 24-hour guard watches over Coyazo, who, despite a chest wound, recovers to face trial for murder. The president, who was taking his after-lunch nap upstairs in Blair House at the time of the shooting, emerged shortly afterward to attend ceremonies at Arlington. Americans of all political beliefs congratulate Mr. Truman on his escape. Okay, we're back. We see it's a very, very big deal. Yes, and even even beyond the uh, newsreel footage, and this is reported in the book American Gunfight, one of the first reporters on the scene uh, hearing the shooting and having been in the era, area was a very young Ben Bradley, who, oh, of ben course, Bradley. was, yes, the very uh, longtime uh, Washington Post editor, and, of course, uh, he's played by, if I remember correctly, Jason Robards in All the President's Men. Yes, so he had an interesting role as a young man uh, starting reporting for Washington Papers at that time. So he hears the shots and, and, and he gets starts, off the trolley? Yeah, yeah. And, of course, the shooting only went on for about a minute. There were a great many shots exchanged. Okay. But... Really, uh, it was just about less than a minute of active gunfire, and of course, at that point, one of the gunmen is already killed, the other is disabled by being wounded, and so it's all over within a minute, less okay. than a minute. All right, and, and as we've mentioned before, and as they say in the newsreel, these are Puerto Rican nationalists. Yes. So why does this happen, say, we can go and talk about the background sure. of Puerto Rican but to Puerto Rico as part of the U.S. Sure. U, in the U.S. sphere of influence, anyway. But why does this happen in 1950? Why is it sort of in the aftermath of World War II? Suddenly, we have we're going to see all this rise of a violent Puerto Rican nationalism. Well, uh, of course, there had always been Puerto Ricans even before the United States took over the island in 1898 in the Spanish-American yeah. War, who wanted their island to be fully independent of any foreign control. First independent uh, from Spain. Sure, and then from the United States once Spain gave Puerto Rico to the United States in uh, that treaty ending the war. But there was an especially strong rise of Puerto Rican national sentiment at the same time that Puerto Rico was trying to establish its status as a, as a commonwealth, or in the Spanish phrase, Estado Libre Asociado, which is free associated state. Mm -hmm. That is the idea of Puerto Rico being part of the United States but still self-governing with regard to its own internal affairs, not with regard to military affairs or trade affairs or any number of things that most states do. Okay. But it, it, of course, had had representative government from really the very very beginning. How fully represented that government was was often debated. Uh, they started with a House of Representatives. They added a Senate later on, though it was always subject to U.S. control. And to limit that control, there was a uh, movement toward a constitution. There was the election of the first uh, Puerto Rican-born governor, as opposed to the appointment of, of a governor. This was in 1948, Luis Munoz Marin. Okay, so you're saying that, that Puerto Ricans weren't chosen to be governors of Puerto Rico? They were appointed from Washington and came, you know, from yes. Maine or something like that? Oh, oh, all kinds of places. Wow. The first native-born Puerto Rican to be appointed governor was Jesus Pinero in 1946. So for a very long time, Puerto Rico was governed, even though it had its own representative government. It did have elections and mm -hmm. uh, did elect first representatives and senators as well. But until 1946, the governors were all non-Puerto Ricans, Americans of various sorts and with the various kinds of political claims on the <laughs> job. I'm sure there were many people who, uh, if they gave enough money, they might look for this kind of job to uh, go down to uh, Puerto Rico and spend some time in the sun. There were some very poor governors 
that were really embarrassments to the United States. This is not oh. uncommon in the history of colonialism. But by the late 40s, to get back toward the assassination attempt, there was a very strong movement led by Louis Munoz Marin, the first elected governor after Jesus Pinheiro was appointed in 1946, then Munoz Marin was elected governor. And of course, okay. these were changes that were accepted by the United States Congress. Right. And Munoz Marin, who had talked a lot about independence earlier in his career, mm -hmm. had basically moved by that point into this, again, this Estado Libre Asociado, or Commonwealth form, where Puerto Rico is a free people, but it agrees to be associated with the United States. At least that's the idea. The idea oh, right, isn't right. that Puerto Rico is forced to be part of the United States, that it is its own democratic choice mm -hmm. uh, to do so. And but, this, this idea of common, a commonwealth and commonwealths is sort of a post-war thing. I mean, the, the British Empire mm -hmm. changes to the British Commonwealth very famously oh, in sure. the late 40s. And whether or not it's actually true that the people of the of, of whatever former colony is vote that mm -hmm. way, that's certainly the spin that's put on it. Well, and throughout this period, the United Nations, of course, the brand new United Nations yeah, at yeah. the end of World War II, is monitoring the colonial status of all kinds of nations around the world. This is the uh, era when most of Africa through the 50s is most African nations are mm -hmm. colonies of European nations, though that's right. beginning to change with nations like Ghana, I believe, is one of the first yeah, independent sure. nations from Great Britain. India's independence movement is of great importance under uh, uh, Mohandas Gandhi right, right. and his leadership of that, and then Jawaharlal Nehru. So independence is the great wave going around the world. The UN is monitoring it and largely encouraging it. But in the case of Puerto Rico, the United States is saying that Puerto Ricans want to be part of the United States. They don't uh -huh. want to be fully independent. And the various elections of people like Luis Munoz Marin and uh, uh, a constitution that uh, he pushes forward that has f a great deal of popular participation behind it and so on, all that is moving forward in the late 1940s. Of course, Puerto Rico was a very important American naval base and yes, air base imagine, yeah. in World War II. So there are all those kinds of links there as well. But the pro-independence movement denies all of this. They say it's all phony, that yeah. Puerto Rico needs to be independent. This Why should movement, we believe it? Yeah, Exactly. And the leader of that independence movement, Pedro Albizu Campos, who leads mm -hmm. the independence movement, though he spends an awful lot of time in U.S. federal prison from the 1930s until his death in the 1960s, Campos, as early as 1932, basically rejected the Puerto Rican electoral process. He hadn't been very successful in it, running for senator, oh. and he decides that it's all phony. Now, is it because he hadn't been successful, or is, in fact, the Puerto Rican election process so controlled by Puerto Rican elites in league with uh, their U.S. supporters and that it's not US a genuine businessmen. process? Yes, yeah. that's, that's certainly his sense of it. I think uh, a great many Puerto Ricans, not to mention Americans, would disagree with that, but that's essentially the conflict that's there. So... It's interesting that that conflict is there because, as as you rightly point out, in the late 40s and even in 1950, just a few months before the assassination attempt, there are all these reforms that are put in that seem to be leading in a more, if you will, home rule or island rule direction. Oh, certainly. Certainly. And I think that is part of what pushes the independence movement to more and more radical steps okay. because they see this as about to be accomplished, that that uh, Munoz Marin's vision of a freely associated Puerto Rico right. is about to come to fruition. He is elected, and by a large margin. Yeah. Now, of course, a lot of people don't go to the polls, but a lot of people don't go to the polls in the United States and so <laughs> yeah, on. So that's, that's, right. that's the controversy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you can't have everyone go to the polls. So yeah. there are questions about the legitimacy of his election, but it is a, a very strong election, and there are opposition parties. After that, as different things are pushed through the U.S. Congress to allow it, there is a uh, constitution 
for mm-hmm. for Puerto Rico and the acceptance of this Commonwealth status or Estado Libre Asociado. Again, the idea in that being the libre, free, that this is a free association of the Puerto Rican people. But the right. pro-independence folks, led by Alba Zucampos, have denied this kind of movement all along. They're more they're more the, of the purest strain. You see this well, a lot in the 20th century. There, it, among nationalist movements, there's usually oh yeah. a moderate strain and a yeah. purest strain, and the purest strain yeah. won't accept anything except sure, complete sure. independence. They're looking for full independence, right? and this is essentially all of those reforms are taking away that possibility. That's right. That's They're right. essentially denying full independence, saying we don't want control of our customs. We don't want our own military control. We want to be under <laughs> the control of the United States for our foreign affairs. So in 1950, a rebellion is planned and occurs just a couple days before the assassination attempt. And there are outbreaks of violence throughout Puerto Rico, San Juan. There's the uh, takeover of a police station in, uh, and I hope my pronunciation is good enough here, Mm -hmm. Hialeah, and all kinds of different uh, attacks, somewhat coordinated, not very effectively coordinated, but there's an effort to coordinate them throughout Puerto Rico. Al Campos is arrested. His very close associate, Doris Torresola, is arrested as well after she's wounded in the attack on Alba Zucampos' headquarters. She is the sister of Griselio Torresola, one of the assassins, oh, who is Griselio Torresola and Oscar Collazo, mm-hmm. uh, the people who go to Washington to shoot at Truman. They hear in New York about the failure, essentially, of the rebellion at the end of October on the island, on Puerto Rico, and they decide to act. Oh, okay. So it's possible that if the rebellion had succeeded, they would have said, well, we don't need to make a big stink by shooting the president. Well, they had been authorized to take take action of some sort, not specified, with a letter they found from Albizu Campos, the leader of the Puerto Rican independence movement. I guess it was up to them to decide what would be useful strategically. What they did with the apparent collapse of the revolution was to uh, try to get the U.S. involved and sort of show how close, you know, what the United States would always say when there were disputes over Puerto Rican independence was that this was a fight among Puerto Ricans, some Puerto Ricans favored independence, most did not. And it was not up to the United States to control because we didn't want to see ourselves a colonial power. Here, they're trying to get the attention of the world by trying to shoot the president to uh, re-implicate, we should say, the United States. Now, of course, in Puerto Rico, the rebellion is put down by a variety of forces, but most of those forces, even though they might be U.S. government forces, are Puerto Ricans that have been organized National Guard. Uh, They called them the insular police Mm -hmm. at that time, insular for the island. But uh, as far as the independence folks are concerned, this is all uh, orchestrated by uh, Washington. And throughout the 1940s, I mean, there have been efforts in recent days to release, and I'm sure the bus killers have run across this on a number of programs, the um, files of the FBI under the Freedom of Information Act. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, I certainly have not read through them, but what they say is that there's some million pages of reports on Puerto Rican independence throughout this entire period and efforts to, uh, to suppress it. As part of Munoz Marin's movement toward the free associated state, there is a law passed in 1948 just in the process of his being elected, just before he's elected, called the gag law, or the ley de mordaza. And what this does is essentially for any Puerto Rican, even displaying the Puerto Rican independence flag, which was a different flag, yeah, yeah. that was seen as a seditious act. Oh, okay. And that in any number of uh, strong statements against uh, the United States or calls for independence could well get someone uh, arrested. And so you see this uh, kind of conflict, this, this growing conflict between the people who want the Commonwealth kind of association with the United States and the independence movement that sees that if 
Commonwealth status is truly accepted by most of the Puerto Rican people, they will have very, very little support. So how does Congress react to the attempted assassination and, and the shootout in the street? And how does the administration react? Do they crack down on Puerto Rican nationalism? Do they, do they try to support the moderates and, and crush the, the, you know, the nationalists, the pure nationalists? I can imagine the public is outraged, but what does the government actually do? The U.S. government really sticks to the idea that while as unfortunate as this episode was, it yeah. was stopped, and that it's another instance of this fight between Puerto Ricos that, as far as the U.S. government concern, is concerned, is being quite well handled by Governor Luis Munoz Marin and his reforms leading to the Commonwealth. Oh, I see. And uh, Munoz Marin, of course, uh, expresses his... Uh, well, there are you know, certainly condolences to the officers who was killed, a man named sure. Leslie Caulfield. Uh, later on, his wife is uh, invited to Puerto Rico to be, you know, for, uh, to accept honors on his behalf. There are efforts to arrest a great many Puerto Rican independent supporters, some of whom have ties in New York City, some of whom who have ties too these two assassins who decided to you know, yeah. take the train down from there. <laughs> a commuter uh, train to yes, D.C. One, one had not been in the U.S. for very long, and that's the one who had a essentially letter of authorization to do something yeah. from Albizu Campos, the leader. That was Griselio Torresola, the younger man. He was in his 20s, mid-20s. And, and he's the one who died. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Oscar Coyazo had actually lived for quite a long time in the United States, and uh, had a uh, pretty stable family life, but still, he had had a long-term commitment to Puerto Rican independence. When Albizu Campos had been in the federal penitentiary, he had had very bad health. He was transferred to, I believe it was Columbia Hospital in New York City in the 1940s during yeah. World War II. At one point to convalesce, he is sent out to a Puerto Rican family rather than staying in the hospital. And he oh. stays with Oscar Coyazo and his wife. And so they actually, I believe, I don't think he stays with them. I think he stays upstairs from them in an apartment building. But they get to know the great hero yeah, yeah, of yeah. Puerto Rican independence, Albizu Campos. They get to know him personally. And Albizu Campos returns to Puerto Rico at the end of 1947 and immediately reignites the independence movement that had been uh, a good deal weakened ever since the 1930s when there were a number of violent episodes and strong suppression of independence and so on. So the of the two assassins, uh, attempted assassins, they have strong ties to this independence movement and many family members and so on are picked up in the aftermath. Still, I think the idea of the, you know, the way the United States views this is that this isn't a real threat. Yes, it was a very unfortunate episode, and uh, if some things had gone wrong, maybe uh, something might have happened to the president. As horrifying as all that is, mm -hmm. there isn't the sense that the United States must move into Puerto Rico or send U.S. troops into Puerto Rico. The idea is that this is a fringe movement, the independence movement, and that the Puerto Ricans are pretty well in control of it. Mm -hmm. And that while a few people might be uh, needed to be arrested uh, around <laughs> New York City, uh, still there's a sense that Munoz Marin and the more moderate Puerto Rican, at least the U.S. V views it, majority, have things pretty well in hand. So what does the U.S. government do? And in, in, is, it, is it in reaction to the assassination? How do they treat the assassination at all? Is, is, are things just still going on the way they're supposed to go? Or are they change the, the approach to uh, the legal treatment of Puerto Rico? Well, the assassination clearly horrifies people throughout America, and especially in the government. Its effect on U.S. policy is uh, minimal. Oh. Uh, already, several months before the assassination, Congress had taken action to consider its relations with Puerto Rico in the nature of a compact that, again, these were two entities deciding freely to associate. We get again back to the idea of freely <laughs> Free association. state. Yeah, keeps now, coming up. whether this was real or as the independence supporters thought of it as a kind of phony process, yeah. still, everything that Puerto Rico does is based on that sense that now that relations from a law enacted on July 3, 1950, again, before the assassination, 
Right. Since those relations are attempt. attempt. Yeah. The assassination attempt, certainly. Before the assassination attempt, what Congress does is say our relations shall be done on an equal basis yeah. between the massive United States and very small Puerto Rico. Again, you can understand the skepticism oh, that sure, the pro-independence sure. people had, but still— Puerto Rico has its own democratic process going back well before 1950. And what happens after the assassination attempt, though mm. I would say it's not caused by the assassination attempt. I know you've often explained to uh, the buzz killers about cause and effect and so on. Yeah, yeah. Just a... because something happens before doesn't mean it caused what follows afterward. What Puerto Rico proceeds to do, according to plan, with its native elected governor, Luis Munoz Marin, already in place well before the assassination, is to have a plebiscite accepting the idea of this commonwealth status. Right. And let's adopting. remind the buzz killers a pleb plebiscite is a, is a, is a special statewide vote. vote. Yes, right. it's special a special vote, vote right. on, yeah. on a special issue. It's not in the regular course of election. Kind That's of like a referendum. Yeah. Yes. And of course, there were lots of plebiscites throughout the 20th century about yeah. different oh, territories yeah. and where should they go and so on. But the idea is first that the Puerto Rican people accept this idea of commonwealth status, that they meet and have a constitutional convention, adopt a constitution, and that constitution is what rules the relations between the U.S. and Puerto Rico within the limits of Puerto Rico taking care of its internal affairs while the United States is essentially responsible for everything else. Oh, right. uh, so this process is ongoing both before and after the assassination attempt. And I would say that the assassination attempt, however horrifying it must have been, didn't really have an awful lot of impact because the pro-independence people are stigmatized as a fringe group. And, of uh, course, we deal with that in the history of terrorism a great deal. Yeah. Well, if terrorism is indeed just the act of a fringe group, it can, while being horrifying, it can be dismissed in various ways with regard to policy. And I think that's essentially the impact of the assassination attempt on Truman. It did not speed the process of reform. Perhaps in the United States, it added to the sense that we really have to allow Puerto Ricans as much independence as this process enabled. Okay. Uh, I don't think they, there certainly weren't calls afterwards. So, you know, the, the United States has to, have, has to have stronger control on Puerto Rico. I'm sure there were people who were suspicious of this uh, in the United States yeah. of Puerto Rico's new status. But I think the one impact that the assassination attempt would have is that let's keep the process going with strong control being maintained as it was within Puerto Rico. I mentioned a little bit ago. The gag law passed in the summer of 1948 while Puerto Rico is in the process of electing its first native-born governor and electing its first governor as opposed to having, having him appointed. appointed. And that law was passed by the Puerto Rican House and Senate. And it was uh, certainly not uh, something that supported civil liberties. It greatly limited right. <laughs> civil liberties. But it was passed in Puerto Rico. And again... All of this led to the sense that, sure, the assassination attempt is horrible, but it's a fight between Puerto Ricans that came into the United States. Right. Uh, because, of course, throughout uh, as early as the 1930s and 40s, there was substantial Puerto Rican uh, migration to the United mm -hmm. States, Puerto Ricans as U.S. citizens, and they had been guaranteed that status since 1917, could freely move. And just to throw in uh, something from popular culture, of course, the uh, famous film and show West Side Story in the late 50s and perhaps right. going into the early 60s highlighted this Puerto Rican migration and its impact on, on New York City. So there's a very strong Puerto Rican emigre community. I would be tempted to say that that emigre community was more supportive of independence. Than, oh, right. than most people on the island of Puerto Rico itself. It certainly was a strong supporter of the independence movement. Okay, that's not uncommon. Often the most the most radical Irish nationalists are, are to, you know do their their work in in Britain in the 19th century especially. While it may have been a close shave for Harry Truman, something happens a couple of a few years later, four years later that's actually much worse. 
Yes, in the sense that U.S. government officials uh, actually are wounded in uh, on March 1st, 1954, uh-huh. uh, while one police officer was killed and uh, several others were wounded in the assassination attempt in right. November 1950. President Truman was not shot. He was merely shot at. On March 1, 1954, a group of four Puerto Rican nationalists, they also come down from New York City. They meet at Grand Central that's a, Station. That's a common theme in this thing. Oh, yes. Down from New yes. York I mean, yeah. New York City this time is, uh, and, and I think it still is, really the area of greatest Puerto Rican migration, though that sure, has sure. extended to Chicago and many uh, cities, uh, especially in the Northeast and Midwest. But it was certainly the epicenter. They're led by a 35-year-old Lolita LeBron who, again, born in Puerto Rico, but uh, had spent some time in the United States. She knew and worked with the great Puerto Rican independence leader, Pedro Albizu Campos, and she had a letter essentially authorizing her to carry out certain unspecified acts. Okay. So there is this strong relationship between uh, the Puerto Rican independence movement on the island and in New York. Lolita LeBron uh, is accompanied by uh, three men, goes down to Washington. They have guns, Mm. uh, semi-automatic pistols, I believe. I'm not a uh, gun expert, but uh, (laughs) that's what I believe they had. They took them on the train. They had gotten into Union Station in Washington. It's not too far from the Capitol. I think I recall that from a trip. And uh, some of the guys are getting uh, cold feet, apparently, about what they're going to do. The plan is to go into Congress and right. start shooting. And Lita LeBron leads him and says, no, I am going. If no one goes with me, well, that's up to you. But I am wow. going to do this. And the men follow her. They get into Congress. They shoot from what at least is known at some point as the ladies' gallery. I don't think it was, obviously, it was not just the ladies' gallery in 1954. This is a gallery in the House of Representatives or in yes. the Senate? No, 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 no. It is in the House of Representatives. Oh, okay. And, of course, what's interesting, too, is that both of these assassination attempts, everyone, and maybe this tells us a lot about the late 40s and the early 50s, is very well dressed. The men are wearing hats. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're wearing suits. They Ties. choose a good suit to do this. Lolita LeBron, and it's easy to find photographs and, and newsreel footage of, of at least her and the men who went with her. Uh, they're all very well dressed. I'm sure they look very respectable, and they're allowed into the House of Rep- Representatives. I don't know what kind of security measures they had then. Obviously, well, there weren't far those, less. Uh, there weren't those uh, uh, gun detectors and metal detectors like oh, there sure, are now. Sure, no, yeah. no. And they pulled out their guns. First, they said the Lord's Prayer. That was the report. <laughs> First, they said the Lord's Prayer. Again, there was a sense that their cause, their sense of their cause was holy. Yeah, oh, sure, And, of sure. course, we find that throughout uh, all yeah. kinds of terrorist acts. And they started firing their weapons. Uh, There were some uh, shots fired uh, just into the roof and around. There wasn't a careful targeting, but uh, a number of congressmen, uh, one I believe is a congressman Bentley from Michigan, was the most severely wounded. Several others were slightly wounded. Then the uh, shooters were captured and so on, and they uh, served long prison terms. But again, even this, as horrifying an act as it was, was still put into the framework by the U.S. government of here are radical Puerto Ricans Mm -hmm. who they may differ from what's going on on the island of Puerto Rico, but the island of Puerto Rico is deciding democratically to retain its relationship with the United States. And so I don't think it had much impact on United States policy. One possible explanation for an attack like this was that in the fall of 1953, the United Nations, of course, had been discussing for many years the status of colonialism around the world. Any nations that had um, dependencies, perhaps we can call them, had yeah. territories that weren't clearly part of that nation, had to report on the progress of those territories toward some form of freedom. Now, mm-hmm. of course, if nations were made independent, then that was pretty simple. They were yep. independent, yep. and it was up to them. But for the United States, it was called on to report to the United Nations on Puerto Rico's progress towards self-rule, with neither the United States nor the majority of Puerto Ricans, at least from the votes that occurred at that time, wanting full independence from the United States. The reports on 
the development of Commonwealth status and so on, went to the United Nations in the fall of 1953. The United States was able to get a vote by the General Assembly of the United Nations, and I don't know if all the nations in the General Assembly voted, yeah. but I recall the vote being 26 to 16. Now, what that points out to me is just how much the United Nations has grown through yeah, the independence right. yeah. of so many nations over Absolutely, the last yeah. uh, 50, yeah. 60 years. But that vote enabled the United States essentially to stop its annual reports, I believe they were annual, they may not have been quite annual, yeah. but their periodic reports on Puerto Rico's progress towards self-rule because the idea was that Commonwealth status had achieved self-rule oh, for I Puerto see, Rico. I see, I the see. independence supporters did not accept this. They saw this as a complete sham. And that's part of the reason why you'd have a radical effort like shooting up the American Congress yeah. to show, if nothing else, the disgust as the independent supporters viewed it over the whole arrangement that had been carefully put into place through a series of votes and so on from 1948 through 1952 and 53. What's amazing to me is it, it, it's very similar in that sense to the, to the 1950 attack on President Truman because, of course, something happens and people get, seem to get more uh, radicalized a, about it. But also that there were four people going into the gallery of the House of Representatives. They start shooting and they don't kill anybody. So is it, um, you know, the, the, the newspapers and the newsreels and all of the, public, the press reaction afterwards must have, th must have also included... Well, these people were crazy because if they're shooting into the ceiling, they must not know what they're doing. I think that's that enables the United States uh, media and United States yeah. opinion to sort of explain away this. And from historians who have looked at the sources of the period, uh, yeah. often these people are, are looked at as uh, deranged in one way or another. They certainly didn't have a very careful plan. There wasn't an effort, you know, that if enough people in Congress had been killed, the United States government had been overthrown. It yeah. was really the effort of really so many terrorist activities to draw attention to a particular movement. And what the independence movement continually tries to do is to focus on the United States, that the United yeah, States right. control not... over Puerto Rico is still colonial, despite yeah. what the UN says, despite what President Truman says. They're not trying to shoot up the the home rulers down in Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth well, people well, in Puerto Rico. Well, there, there, there are a lot of things going on uh, of various sorts at different times in Puerto oh, okay. Rico. I mean, it isn't that Puerto Rico is free of violence and free of disputes and so on, though, uh, you know, that goes on uh, for many years. And of course, in, in later years, there will even be uh, bombings in the United States and so on over this, uh, okay. over this issue. Well, let's hear a clip from a news report of the, about the 1954, uh, the attack on Congress and... Of course, remember in the 50s, those, those newsreels and radio news announcers often would dramatize things with their, with their voices and make things seem as if things are about to end. Right back. Fashion notes for a tropic holiday featuring styles by Hawaii's leading designers combining the sophistication of the West with the exotic gracefulness of the Orient. This Waikiki blue silk organza is hand-painted, ancient craftsmanship for modern effect. Fringed cotton with accompanying kerchief and a colorful red and white garden print. The traditional sari of India is recast for Western tastes in this graceful creation, retaining the ageless mystery of the East. Proud as a peacock and considerably prettier is the girl who wears this colorful ensemble. Shiver my timbers, here's a piratical play suit. Blue cotton with appliqued swashbuckler pants for the gal who longs to be bold and dangerous. Quite the opposite effect with this languorous lounging outfit on black and white pattern velvet. Here's Hawaiian fashion to make you forget the hula. In New York, the third international motor sports show opens. This spectacular West German job is one of the many stars of the show. Note how the steering wheel pushes out of the way for entrance. Even more eye-popping is the bat, if only for its price tag, but it has other unusual features worth a glance, even if you can't afford the car. Here's an American product, body styled in Italy and called appropriately the Italia. Very sporty, too. 
Pause and catch your breath. It's a beauty typical of the strong international trend of the show with more foreign cars on display than ever before. A lovely collection of chassis. In Washington, D.C., ruthless fanatic violence erupted in the halls of Congress. Three men and a woman believed to be members of the Puerto Rican nationalist gang that in November 1950 attempted the assassination of President Truman opened fire from the visitor's gallery of the House of Representatives. Five congressmen were hit. Ben F. Jensen of Iowa, Clifford Davis of Tennessee, Kenneth Roberts of Alabama, George H. Fallon of Maryland, and Albert Bentley of Michigan, who was seriously injured. Observers noted the attack came as the Inter-American Conference opened in Venezuela, and it suggested the motive may have been to arouse anti-United States feeling in Latin America through an act of apparently blind violence carefully calculated to inflame America's relations with her neighbors. Estimates of the numbers of shots fired range from 15 to 30, and each bullet hole found is a grim reminder to those who were present of the terrible surprise attack. The gang, seized by shocked bystanders as they emptied their guns, was held at police headquarters as a widespread search was launched for others who shared in the plot. To Irving Forrest, Raphael Miranda, Mrs. Lolita Lebron, Andre Cordero, the gun wielders, and to their accomplices goes the evil distinction of having perpetrated a criminal outrage almost unique in America's history. Wanton violence that shocked and stirred the nation and did only harm to the cause of the Puerto Rican people. And we're back. And so, Professor, I think what will fascinate the Busco is what fascinated me when I first started, to, we, when we talked about this uh, in the beginning, was, you know, th these things are sort of not, there's only one book on the Harry Truman. There are probably no books on the Congress attack. It's, it's not, not well, not not well known. Found. And, at, least not, at, at least not in English. There's a yeah. good deal of, of writing oh, sure, in Spanish. Sure. Though that, of course, tends to be about uh, the independence movement and sort of from a from a more Puerto Rican focused perspective. But these are terrorist attacks in Washington yes. on major government officials, yes. and one of the things, we, of course, we bust myths and we try to clear up misconceptions, but we also try to unearth things that should be studied further. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, these are uh, uh, both very very interesting episodes, and the uh, there was. There was perhaps less planning in the 1954 attack on Congress. I think, again, that was just an effort to get the world's attention. Yeah. It was done on the same day as an inter-American Congress was convening in Caracas. Oh. <laughs> and so if we think of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, getting sympathy from uh, uh, other, you know, from Latin American nations that the Puerto Rican independent supporters want to be, <laughs> that's what they want to be, an independent uh, Latin American nation, the 1950 attack, uh, while just two men going after the president, may have come pretty close to success, as I mentioned before. Now, mm. again, what would have happened if President Truman actually had been murdered by these Puerto Rican independence supporters? What the reaction would have been at that point? Perhaps the interest was, and this happens in the history of terrorism, if the United States had decided at that point that Puerto Rico was so out of control that right. a full colonial control must be reinstituted and that whatever steps that Luis Munoz Marine was leading toward a semi-independent Puerto Rico should be stopped and re-examined, that might have uh, been seen as a possible reigniting of Puerto Rican independence. I mean, often oh, okay. the idea is to provoke a, t a conservative reaction. Maybe that would have happened. You mean if, the, clamp, if, the government, U.S. would have clamped down and well, then there would have been well, this kind actually, of civil war in Puerto Rico? Uh, I've or not, an anti-colonial anti war. Sure, right. sure. I think that kind of thing often happens. I've not seen a document where Pedro Albizu Campos says this will happen and this will yeah. happen and all hell will break loose. But and all again, hell breaking loose will be good for the independence movement, well, is what it, he could it's, argue. I think really the independence movement saw itself from the late 40s on as becoming less and less relevant to Puerto Rican life. 
uh, on the island because, again, the process is at least on the face of it. And, of course, those who support the Commonwealth uh, that has been around for a great many years, more than 60 years now, uh, see it as a fully democratic effort. But those who wanted an independence Puerto Rico and, of course, have continued to want it. There was Mm -hmm, just recently mm -hmm. a... um, man who had been convicted of sedition against the United States for involvement in bomb plots back in the 1970s and 80s, a man named Rivera, who was uh, finally released from federal custody. I think he had been in federal custody for uh, more than 30 years, and uh, he's seen as a kind of hero of Puerto Rican independence uh, and was so celebrated in uh, the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York City. So these issues continue, maybe in small ways, yeah. but they continue right up to today. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It seems to happen. Something seems to happen, something big, not necessarily an attack on Congress or the president, but a certain kind of a flashpointy thing happens sort of every 10 years after 1954. There's always a more turmoil over this issue in Puerto Rico. Right. But in the United States, the close relationship of the emigre community, that, of course, can go back and forth. I mean, different than than some immigration efforts, it's quite easy to go back and forth Mm -hmm. between San Juan and New York, San Juan and Philadelphia, San Juan and Chicago. And so just about whatever goes on on the island will have people who uh, still have that dream of Puerto Rican independence at least playing some kind of role, making some kind of statement. There are certainly books being published and statements being yeah. made at, newspapers, uh, at, at newspapers. events like a Puerto Rican uh, Day Parade in New York City. This issue often comes up. There were a series of bombings, too, in the United States in the late mm-hmm. 70s, the early 80s. People were arrested, like uh, Oscar Rivera, who I mentioned. I don't think I mentioned his name, but uh, the man had just recently been released from federal custody. Lolita Lebron was released in the late 70s. There was a great campaign for her release. The idea is she had served long enough as a kind of freedom fighter. Yeah, that's uh, You right, can either yeah. see her as a freedom fighter or someone who, who shot up Congress. In fact, yeah. she did both. Yeah. But shortly after she was released by President Carter after a big campaign for it, she then received an award in Cuba called the Order of the Playa Giron. The Playa Giron was where the Bay of Pigs invasion, the failed Cuban exile invasion supported by the United States and the CIA, failed back in 1961. And so Lolita Lebron was seen as a great fighter for Latin American independence by the regime of Fidel Castro. And there are any number of interesting ties between Puerto Rican independence people and the Cuban communist regime, which again sees itself as a vigorous anti-colonial regime. But really this kind of interplay of the episodes, the many bombings, uh, some of which took lives in the 70s and early 80s, and then people being arrested for those, and then the question is, well, how long should they serve, and should there be clemency for them, and at what point should they be released? And of course, really beyond that, and more significant, is the economic status of Puerto Rico, which, while it had seen a good deal of economic progress in the 1950s and 1960s, from the 1970s on, its economic growth has slowed and even turned into so-called negative growth. We don't Mm -hmm, like to talk mm -hmm. about decline, but that's really what negative growth is. Or depression. Um, In more recent years, especially since uh, about 2006, 2007, as the Great Recession got going, it had an especially vigorous impact, unfortunate impact on Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's population has declined, I believe, about 10% in the last 10 to 15 years, as many more people have migrated out, generally to the United States. And as we speak right now, again, this isn't a program on current affairs, but as we speak right now, Puerto Rico's fiscal status, its financial status is very, very uh, perilous. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of fights as to people who uh, invested in Puerto Rican bonds. Uh, Will they have to take a so-called haircut less than what they had um, 
Yeah. You know, essentially, will they lose some of their principal of their investment? Uh, hedge funds were major players with Puerto Rican debt, and they're fighting in court what the Puerto Rican government's obligations are under its rather uh, unique status as a commonwealth. Mm -hmm. What kind of U.S. government support will occur? President Obama was somewhat supportive of trying to help Puerto Rico in various ways. Right. President Trump is far less supportive. And so there are uh, austerity measures going through Puerto Rico. I remember reading about protests over the uh, closing of a large number of schools. I think we're mm -hmm. more than 100 mm -hmm. schools. Right. Yeah. Is this because of a bloated public sector where money must be saved? Or does it show instead that the United States needs to give more help to its, in the view of people who support independence, its oldest colony? Well, you see, Buzzkillers, that's what's so fascinating. One of the things that's so fascinating about these flashpoint things, like the Truman assassination attempt, the attack on Congress, not only are they important in their own right, but they give us the opportunity to look into issues that are often forgotten. I tend to think of Caribbean history as being an 18th century, early 19th century thing, but it certainly goes well into this century and into the Cold War. So thank you, Professor, for helping us understand the importance of these central episodes, but also the broader importance of Puerto Rican nationalism. Yes, and I do want to uh, just close. Of course, it's always uh, a pleasure to uh, appear here with you, Professor. But I do think back to the time that I did some teaching, and I recall one particular class on the history of the 20th century world. And I just happened to mention, uh, not because it was a special interest, at least at that time of mine, but I happened to mention Puerto Rico and go into a little bit of an explanation of it and a course on world history. Yeah. And I had several students in that class from Puerto Rico. All right. And they were so thankful and so glad to have this mention and so on. It actually spurred me to do some research and bring up Puerto Rico's uh, role in uh, several things as that course went on. And these students were kind enough at the end of class to uh, give me a little book on Luis Munoz Marin. And what that, of All course, right. emphasized for me is sort of the great pride that people of every nation, small and large, have in their lives and their history and the hopes they have for their future. And we can certainly see that from all the different sides in the in Puerto Rico and all of the controversy that they have been involved in, as difficult as it has been, again, shows that great pride in place and hope for the future that we all have wherever we are. That's right. And we hope you have it, Buzzkillers, wherever you are. Talk to you next week. This is Mary Todd Lincoln. President Lincoln is indisposed at the moment, but he asked me to remind you that Professor Buzzkill is part of Entertainment One's podcast network and is available on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and all major podcast apps. Please subscribe and leave him a review. Please also go to ProfessorBuzzkill.com to support him on Patreon, to subscribe to his email notification and to shop the Buzzkill bookshelf. Follow him on Facebook, on Twitter at BuzzkillProf, and on Instagram at Professor Buzzkill. Thanks for listening.